preparing to live stream the meeting. Okay. All right. Well, sky watchers everywhere, <laughs> certainly in Southern California, welcome aboard. It's our latest in one year edition of the SBAU Astro Hour. I'm Baron Ron Heron, proud to be your host. It's a regular Monday morning blog podcast, 11 to noon every week for the Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit. And these are the Brain Trust members. I'm Vice President. I'll introduce you to the President, some of the other board members. Indeed, it's our 52nd episode, as we started a year ago on March 1st. And about a week from now will be March 1st. We'll get one more show. 53 will be next 28th, the last day of February. Uh, this hour, we're going to talk about all kinds of stuff here. Nebulas and star clusters are us into uh, the night sky with a few constellations, get some reports. I'm sure we got Chrissy Cook um, watching and Tim Crawford, a staunch supporter, but let's meet the Brain Trust. Mr. President, Jerry Wilson. Who is Good morning. Good morning. Dressed, dressed in white. Oh, that's just your beard and your hair like me. Yeah, it's, no, it's just the- uh, Oh, there it is. Logo. <laughs> <laughs> did you get your? Did you buy your dog one of the large size SBAU T-shirts? No, not T-shirts. Actually, I was a large. Yeah. Okay. Well, I've got two, and I live in them. Wife is Pat Forgy. Everybody doing well? He's uh -huh. building his backyard. You're not building an, uh, an observatory though in the backyard, are you? Yeah. Yeah, we are. The framers are for starting work this morning. Wow. Okay. Let's get our outreach coordinator on Chuck McPartland before he gets yanked off by Edison. Chuck is also married to a Pat, our merchandise manager, Pat McPartland. Running the show, Tom Totten, webmaster, technical wizard, former president himself some four years ago. Tom Whittemore. Morning. Tom, yes, Tom is married to Maureen, former Westmont College science instructor, gave that career up to bake sourdough bread, and that's why you're smelling that right now. <laughs> they also... Big. What? <laughs> I've been making sourdough bread for a long time. <laughs> well, you certainly do it on Mondays. I tell you, I'm, I'm going to order I, one soon. I baked every morning last week. Is that right? Do you sell them? Every do you sell them or just give them away? I just give them away. Yeah. Well, if you ever, my birthday's coming up, so. <laughs> <laughs> you also oh, Ron, sp speaking of birthdays, um, but Art Harris has got a birthday today, right, Chuck? I think that's. Yesterday yeah. or today, yeah. Not that oh, you Art. Have you heard anything from Art lately? Yeah, he's doing fine. Yeah. Okay. I, I tried he's to. I tried better. to give him a fresh rye on Saturday. I baked a beautiful rye because uh, I know he likes rye bread. He's from New yeah. York, and uh, no, it just went to message both times. So I think oh. he was off uh, visiting the junkyard in Lompoc with Edgar. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right, okay. tell us who Edgar is. He's our Filipino connection. Edgar Campo, yeah, he's he's a longtime mm -hmm. member. He's yeah. back. I miss the mazes uh, because uh, they, yeah, they're they, doing okay. Last I heard. Well, if they need a computer, um, Mr. President, you gave me one of your old computers, and it's still sitting here unused. All we got to do is get it connected to the internet, and maybe Martin and Janet could join us and never get to eat those deviled eggs she used to make for our following the meetings. <laughs> Speaking of the meetings, let me tell you that our second online virtual SBAU general meeting will be a week from this coming Friday, March 4th at 7.30, right, gentlemen? It, um, as a speaker, we have a lady who's talked before, Briley Lynn Lewis, a UCLA grad student on her way to a degree in astrophysics. Before I uh, go to the silly stuff, do you mind if I throw a couple of questions at you that I got off of uh, Jeopardy last week? They're having their big uh, college tournament. And they had one question on astronomy and one on physics. And I have a feeling Jerry and T uh, Chuck will know these. So I want you to hold off answering before Tom, the two Toms have a chance. Okay, here was one question. I don't, I'm one of these, nobody got it right. What is the closest giant, red giant to the earth? Huh. Tom Whittemore, do you know? Um, I, I would just say Aldebaran. Um, hold on. Either Aldebaran or maybe Arcturus. Arcturus? Arcturus. All right, uh, Jerry 35. Wilson or Chuck, do you know? I would think Arcturus. Yeah. I, it's close. I think it's Aldebaran 65 and I'm, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, Aldebaran 65, Arcturus, I think it's 37. How about Ontario? Yeah. Well, oh, that's 600. To, 
According and Terry's well, pretty hey, Jerry. According to the hostess last Tuesday night, this must be the one nobody got right. It's called Gamma Crucis. It's in the oh, Southern God. Cross. Oh, okay. Uh, well, that's not we can't even get it right. Southern Hemisphere. <laughs> we can't even see it here. <laughs> I, think, I think maybe you'll all get this one. This was the final Jeopardy question about physics. Uh, they wanted to know, uh, and I think they all got this one, so you will too. In 1927, this man was the prize winner, Nobel Prize for Physics. He was quoted as saying, the true nature of the universe may never be known. And he came up with the uncertainty principle. Uh, Heisenberg. <laughs> Werner Heisenberg. What's, so what's his uncertainty? I, I'm not really yeah. sure. I think it was Werner Heisenberg. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think they put the uncertainty principle in the question, but uh, yeah. they got it right anyway. So this hour, let's see. We're going to target an open star cluster inside Perseus the hero. Find out where Comet 19P Borelli is. Uh, open star clusters and nebulas. There's an owl out there. Can we start, though, with some of the sillies? And one of them, I guess, it touches on the Webb telescope. But uh, Tom Todd, if you'll just start calling things up one at a time. These are forwarded silly science cartoons that come from our esteemed president okay. during the week. <laughs> hey, the, first would... one, the first one involves cats. So let's hear. Let's see this cats? one. Are you sure? Yeah. I missed that one, but I can see it. Uh, Dr. Hugh, we've discovered a new planet, X301276. And he says X301278. Oh, not six, it's B. We mm -hmm. couldn't have named it Hercules or something. Who the hell's in charge of naming planets? And there's one of Chuck's cats. <laughs> Doing itself, wrong question. <laughs> okay. Why did I not get that one? Maybe I, I remember it. It might have been erased last year. Throw up something else, Tom. <laughs> All right, here we go. Let's see. Sets the mood for a little. Ah, here we are. Oops, too big. I don't remember this one. This giant yes. molecular cloud collapsed under its own gravity. You won't believe what it looked like now. Ten signs that you are going supernova. Number three will shock you. You fuse hydrogen into helium with one simple trick. This red, uh, your pictures are covering this one. Somebody else want to read that last one? Because I can. This red guy invented a glowing, glowing shell of ionized gas. What happened next will blow your mind. <laughs> okay. I like that. Clickbait, gonna, pretty cool. What are you going to get to the couple in front of the water, or the catapulted king, uh, the two astronomers walking into the observatory? Did I get a oh, you want, set of interviews? There we go. Oh, hold on. Forwarded? Well, here's another one, Ron. Maybe you didn't <laughs> get this one either. I did, but I didn't write it down. Alien abduction gone wrong. We're kidnapping the creature. All right, that's great. Got it. Yeah, that's that's how, next that looks one. like a far side. That's a far side, isn't it? It's it's oh. sort of looks like this stuff. It's, it's a, a similar layer, style, but it's Claire called Ruben. Ruben. Hmm. Okay. This was cute. Oh, I like a limerick. Does it look like a limerick to you? Well, I'll try this. A dozen, a gross, and a score. Plus three times the square root of four divided by seven plus five times 11 is nine squared and not a bit more. And the heck, 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 heck. <laughs> not binary poetry RS. Okay, you're not getting any of them that I wrote down. I don't know why. But uh, the two dogs sitting on the roof. Oh, here we go. Ah, you can have my time on the telescope tonight, Jerry. I feel small and <laughs> insignificant enough already for crying out. Pretty good. That's good. Okay, now these are the ones I got. And I can actually read them off my screen. I think uh, I hear Bruce. Bruce. Yeah. <laughs> Is Bruce on board? I'll introduce you in a minute. These are the two That's dogs him. sitting atop their doghouse on the roof looking at the night sky. Big Dog says to the little one, you know, the Webb telescope that's been launched into space will be able to see further than any other telescope. He goes on, besides peering into the origins of the universe, it may even spot habitable planets. Then he says, just think, Sakura. What's the name of your dog, Jerry? I was going to change the name of this. Honey. honey. What is it? Honey. 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 Just think, honey. With uh, the Webb telescope, uh, we may know the other one so to see. Then uh, just think, uh, entire new worlds could come our way. And the little one says, which planets are dog friendly? Oh, God, I don't think so, any of them, to which the little one just says it's all rubbish. Hmm. Can we get an update going into the uh, James Webb Hubble telescope? Not there Hubble. is there is one in the in the write up, Ron. Yeah. 
Well, all I have is uh, they've opened a new, what did I write down? One step closer to segment alignment is all I had. Yeah, yeah it has pictures of how they're aligning it. Yeah. Okay, so that's basically all we have to report about. The no, they're posting <laughs> images on YouTube right now. Last night I was looking at. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome aboard. BJK, BK, what? BKM, <laughs> Bruce. BKM Bruce. is uh, Bruce. Bruce K. Murdoch. Yeah, Bruce right. Murdoch. Well, how's, how's Bonnie? Incredible. Well, I've been told that, so you're a lucky <laughs> man. Before we uh, go into Brian. anything else, uh, is there something you want to tell us, Tom Whittemore, about what you're seeing in the night sky recently? You were chatting. Oh, it's annually. just the, the morning. I mean, uh, right now we have a pretty good apparition of mercury in the early morning before the sun comes up. Um, uh, I, I couldn't see Mercury this morning because the uh, clouds were in the way, but Venus, you can see, especially over the last week or two, has just been rocketing up, up, up in the sky and is leaving Mars behind, okay? Uh, if I were to see Mercury this morning, I'm sure it would show me a very, very extended triangle of stars, but folks should look to the southeast if they have a pretty good horizon. Uh, easy to see our Venus, rising first and then Mars next. Mars will be to the right and slightly below, okay? Mercury is a little tougher now, especially since um, uh, it's been diving down towards the sun again, if you like, okay? But in principle, we'll be able to see this for another week at least, I think, but you have to have pretty good horizon, okay? So those okay. are your three morning planets. Uh, Jupiter looks like it's behind the sun now, Yeah. okay? Right, Chuck? Okay. Uh, it's not quite in conjunction yet, but it's it's blocked by yeah. the sun. So I, nice. I lost there like a week and a half ago. Okay. Yeah, that, really? that would be in the western sky, southwest. How do so you that, that's, kind of it. that's kind of it, Ron. Well, how do you suppose our ancient uh, um, grandfathers, thousands of years ago, recorded the changes in the night sky? Did they just remember? You suppose, or did they chisel it down on something? Oh, or probably market? both. Yeah. Um, well, Chuck, papyrus. Is, what? Papyrus. Oh, okay. <laughs> Chuck, did I introduce you as outreach coordinator? I don't remember saying yeah. that. I get. I okay. Have you been occulting any um, stars <laughs> blinking out lately? Um, I've had a couple of negatives and and a cloud out, and tonight there's a, a good one actually. Uh, that's coming right over the uh, shadow path center line is like a hundred yards up the hill from me. So wow! <laughs> even though it's only like a 5% rated chance from the, um, in what they're unsure of in the orbit of the, of the asteroid. Uh, it's also got a tiny moon. So uh, I'm definitely wow. going to give it a try tonight, just in case. Wow. Okay. Now you've got to be inside a band across the earth that would have that happen, right? Yes. Oh, and you know you were, but you still didn't see it. Well, this is what I'm going to try tonight that I'm talking about. I'm talking about there were others time. where, yes, I, I was not necessarily in the shadow path, but within the one sigma error zone. And then you still try because they want to pin down the orbit. Are you recording all these sightings? Yeah. And if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. You just erase it and don't use it. Well, Depending, you may send in a report because you might be the picket fence that shows the edge of where the asteroid was. Okay. To determine the size. Well, there are people all over the planet doing what you do, but you're the only one in our club, as far as I know. Mr. President, what would you like to talk about first among all the strange stuff well, we've got? Let's segue into a brief one, the latest from the James Webb Space Telescope. Oh, okay. I thought all that we had was that one line. What do you know? Now, the, the pictures, um, the picture jumped to the next page after that. Got to keep okay. scrolling down. Oh, maybe I said the first picture that we have um, a segment identification mosaic. That pic we showed picture we showed uh, last week, and it shows the. Um, it identifies the mirror segments, but these are just happenstance all around. Now the, the next step has been taken in that, uh, and that's shown in the next picture, which shows the image array, it's called. And now the, um, they're in the mosaic that corresponds to the same mosaic the um, segments are in. And you can see that the, even though it's, these are all different images of the same star, 
HD something or other. Um, these they each represented it in different ways. So these segments of these mirrors at this point, they all have very bad um, cor corrected, badly corrected surfaces. So at this point in our mirror work waking workshop, we would have to go back and repolish our mirror to get these the right configuration. But these segments up in space, they have little actuators, so it's going to distort the mirror into the correct um, surface to be part of the main master mirror. But that hasn't done yet. That's the next step. First, they've got the they've got control of the position of the image, even though the image from each segment is a bad image. Um, and you see here, they're arrayed as they are in the in the total mirror. The next one, after they get each one to be a very good spot, after they correct each segment, then they're going to tilt the mirror so all the segments come together into a single mirror image in the mirror, in the um, center. Wow. So image A2 there looks pretty good. It looks like they've got a Botanov mask. <laughs> yeah. Which one are you talking about? A2? A2? Oh, yeah. It does look like a Batonoff mask. A what? A what kind of mask? Oh, it's a focusing mask you put on a telescope to help you know when you're in yeah. focus. It well, causes a certain diffraction pattern. The star to break up into a diffraction pattern. And from from watching the symmetry of the diffraction pattern, you can tell how close to focus your mirror is. It's the way I focus my telescopes uh, for imaging. It's become probably one of the most popular ways to do it. But you have to remember to take the baton off mask after you focus <laughs> before you take the picture. I, it makes for some nice pictures, though, with the, with the diffraction spikes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, one of my students at Westmont to use on the 8-inch refractor made one of his own. Uh -huh. yeah, it really did make a difference. He, he cut it himself. Mm -hmm. wow. I can send uh, anybody that's interested a, a, a PDF file, or I, yeah, I can do this PDF, any kind of file, of a batten up mask, and you simply print it on geograph film. Are these the masks we're seeing here? Yes. Yeah. Those are different versions of batten off masks. Batten off masks. That's, is it, that's, it has nothing to do with the center receiving part or receptor, right? of a telescope like that? You put it over the front objective. Oh. It's your, you replace your lens cap with that. Yeah. Huh. What up, looks like my barbecue grill. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Oh, Ron, we'll go back to the, to the James Webb here in just a sec. Oh, you Is know, this picture you just we'll put up, Tom, that picture you just put up with the lens there, I just got an email from Matt Hall, who's an old time member from the 80s and before uh, 85 or so in the club. Uh -huh. And he was he was a big time photographer, astrophotographer, and he's still using film. He made a four by five. He fabricated his own four by five film camera. And he had bought many years ago a lens from 1953 that was used in an Air Force reconnaissance system. And uh, he's made it into a little imaging telescope that talks to his 4.5, 4 by 5 camera. And he's getting ready for first light to go out and take pictures with it. But the glass over the years, apparently it's a, uh, it's the radioactive element glass. Um, and, yeah, and it, um, it uh, over time it turns brown uh, from the uh, alpha particle emissions that it's doing. It, it gradually turns brown. And he found out that you can clear it again by exposing it to strong ultraviolet light. So he went and he bought an ultraviolet light source and he placed the, the lens under it for, I don't know, seven days or something and it cleared it up. So it was pretty cool. Did he make a good speaker for the April general meeting? We can try. I don't know yeah. if he'll want to. Give him a call. Well, send me his email or his phone yeah. number. Okay. Yeah, yeah we'll do. Years ago, back in the 60s, I made a similar camera for shooting on 4 by 5 cut film. And, but I used a smaller lens than he had. I have a 4-inch diameter Aero Tessar lens, which was F6. Uh, uh, this, this is like a 6-inch, and it looks like it's F3 you know, three or 2. This is, he said it's a 12-inch 12 12, 12 F2.5. Okay. These are, you got his email? These are yeah. the it's a lot of heavy glass. Yeah. 
that might be a good time to mention that these are the sort of things you guys talk a lot about tomorrow on the Tuesday workshop, which is still on, right, Tom Totten? Yeah. Yes. Still One of the common topics, yeah. And the world can watch that on YouTube or even take part. I'm not sure how that works. What are we looking at now? Oh, there we go. We're back to the web. So they're tuning. If, is that way a way of saying they're tuning up all 18 of those little hexagon parts of yep. the mirror? Yes. I have a question. Uh, you know, I've been watching YouTube and they're displaying images that have been taken by the James Webb, you know, hours ago, for example. Uh, just off of one of the segments, I don't understand what's going on. How, I mean, this is not astrophotography quality that we're looking at right now out here. It's all, you know, screwed around. I, well, I would the, say, you know, check your URL for that YouTube and make sure it's actually from the real world. Okay. So, um, yes, this, this is the, they're doing engineering adjustment of the telescope itself. It's not ready to take pictures of anything. And when it takes pictures of things, because um, it's not completely cooled down now, this is a very bright star. And when they get it um, aligned and adjusted and pointed, they will not be taking pictures of this star because this is far too bright in the infrared for their system. Oh. So, so I would say that there's something that um, you might be following some clickbait or something. Would it be fair to say that it's parked looking upward since it's uh, into Ursa Major and not far from Polaris, the Bear and Dipper? It's looking, it's looking to north on the Earth, but from, in the from sky the it has its own directions. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> well, it'll take a while. And eventually all 18 of those images will look the same and they'll be able to coagulate them into one incredible it'll, photograph. Yeah. It'll be one yes. image, yeah. So Tim Crawford has a question about, uh, it says, uh, Jerry, how are the elongated star images being categorized? Is that astigmatism or what? Coma? Oh, no, there could be all sorts of things. All of them. Uh, yeah. yeah, I don't see any hallmarks of coma there. And these things do look like they have some kind of Batnoff mask in front of them. They might it looks be like they have a bad some, astigmatism. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know the setup, and I don't know how they're characterizing that. It looks fine to me when I take my glasses off. <laughs> <laughs> you need new glasses. <laughs> how come uh, um, segments B2 and B6 are big splatters? Yeah. They're the most out of whack. I would say yeah. I noticed that. Probably out of focus. Yeah, okay, that's the main reason. Yeah. Well, one of your sillies that you sent to us, Jerry, showed a bunch of macaws up in space. That's not a takeoff on this, is it? No, that showed that showed toucans. Toucans, <laughs> not macaws. As a matter of fact, it showed 47 of them. Yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't get it, but I, I guess... Oh, it's the name of, of an asterism. Oh, was it? Uh, Globular star cluster in the south, south southern skies. Tom, can you show that one? 47 yeah. to Tyler? I'm getting there. Well, Here it is. Count them. <laughs> okay, that's, there you go. That doesn't look anything like, very li little like the web. So what are, what is that? That's an asterism? No, that's it's a globular a, cluster. It's a globular oh, cluster. Oh, it's, it's a, a big one. one. Called Tucanai? 47 Tucane. Tucane. I see. I got it. Okay. A bunch of Tucans up in space. Well, would you like to visit another star cluster inside Perseus, the hero, or one inside Cancer, or Scorpius, uh, Leo the Lion? Take your pick, gentlemen. There's 88 of them. We've only got three or four highlighted this week. Well, let's take a look at lenticular galaxies. Oh, okay. We've been talking about that every week. Let me read you real quickly what you wrote down. They're intermediate between elliptical, the E-type, and spiral galaxies. Lenticulars have large disks, but no spiral arms, used up interstellar matter, and no new stars being made. They're dead, yeah. dead galaxies. That, this is Centaurus A, and that's not usually considered a lenticular. Really? 
Why? What it it doesn't have that shape. It's it's more of a it's a collision between a spiral and an elliptical. I see more dust than stars. It seems like. Yeah. Well, it looks that's like that's a hallmark of the spirals. Yeah. Well, it looks like down if you look at the chart below it. Um, so it's it's a fast rotator so so um okay so it's got some arm yeah huh. well i so know this is very different than the um who was that guy back in the 30s that did the chart of the galaxies this and, the is, it's Hubble. Okay. and and this looks like a Hubble classification of spirals here. The S A S B S C S D, that's spirals. Yeah. So yes. that wasn't a lenticular. Yeah. No, but the earlier here, um, you look down the. Oops. Well, there I didn't. Go. I didn't capture the discussion, but they they the write up um, Wikipedia. You look up lenticular, and you get these these things. Yeah. Well, it's you're an S type, and Centaurus A is so, and that does fit on the early type or lenticular type galaxies. But well, I don't know about it being a collision. It's if it's if it is, we I'm not saying you're wrong, but because uh, I'm learning it as we go. But uh, it looks like an unusually stable collision. Usually things are distorted and thrown all the way over the place. Well, you noted in your note, your uh, notes to us that uh, these are called SOs. Yeah, yeah. SO type galaxies. But, but, now, but the S what? is for spiral. See, that's that's what's confusing me. Okay. Tom, could you call up that diagram again of S, D's, SOs, S, everything else? And I'll point yeah. out what I just noted. I'm trying it, to it, figure it looks It looks like the Hubble classification for, you know, late and early spirals. Right. Okay, well, our but SOs. Not so much lenticulars. Um, the only SOs I see on that screen are called fast rotators. Is that a quality of lenticulars? Do they rotate fast? No, it's, no this, this classification of galaxies is purely morphological. Yeah. Morphological. So it, it just exactly. means the different shapes. Oh, it's a shape. It's not, and these things evolve so slowly. It's not clear to me that when you show uh, something's early type and something else is late type, um, that that's really definitive. That one comes before the other as a stage. They do, you, may have. do you happen to know what those S A S B S C S D mean? Well, those are the different stages. See, Hubble originally right. came up with this as a as he thought it was an evolutionary diagram of spiral galaxies that they right. gradually changed from one type to another, and he did A, B, C, D. Oh, I see, I got it, I am right, okay. But S O. You see down, down on the lower right corner, you see there is under SM, the second one under SM. You see okay. there's, no, there's no core, yeah. it's just the spiral arms. Now I read somewhere that the, the things with large cores, galaxies with large cores, have one or more black holes at the center, massive, massive black holes and that galaxies without a prominent core bulge uh, have no known black hole. I don't know if that's still true or not. That would have been a speculation early on in the discovery of black holes in the center of galaxies. Chuck, what but, the big, on that? but the big ellipticals are just giant cotton balls, huge. You could put yeah. thousands of Milky Ways in them, couldn't you? Pretty much. Okay, so they're, they're, they're saying the lenticulars are on the left here and the spirals are on the right. Right. And, and somehow they're, set, they're trying to imply that a, a lenticular is an early type spiral. So, yeah. According to Hubble's definition, probably. But would it be hard to imagine that in a galaxy like ours, a spiral, since the stars are, for want of a better word, pretty much organized and that they're all going like a racetrack. But in something like this, are they going anywhere together? Uh, Tom, can you show the picture that I sent just this morning, just to okay. you? 
I think I can find that. Let's see. Where'd you go? Mm. Oh, we lost Tom. Time. Lost Tom at uh, Whittemore, didn't we? Uh, Whittemore, yeah. Let's see. Oh, yeah. That, I gotta find that photo. Where'd it go? So uh, AT and T must have cut his tables instead of Chuck's. <laughs> there it is. All right, so I should be able to share this. Here we go. Galaxy rotation. Okay. I don't know why there's two of them. The caption tells you why there's two of them. Oh, is there? Oh, I don't see the caption. Oh, oh it, it was in the text of the email. Yeah, but this shows the, the way, um, which is kind of intuitive, the way the galaxies are perceived to rotate. Sure. So the arms, the arms in this case that they're showing are trailing. Right. Um, but Chuck and I have both seen things where the arms lead, or the claim is that the arms lead. So, but you can't take a picture and then a couple of weeks later take another picture and see any motion. So yeah, you have to be able to get spectra. Yeah, so and Jerry, this one, you're not getting any um, Doppler effect because you're looking straight on for these galaxies. Tom? So Jerry, it says something about this is the one on the left is present day and the one on the right is more distant or something. Hmm. Comparison. Yeah, and you see the arrows are bigger on the present day one, meaning implying that it's rotating faster uh, uh, in okay. the arms. And on the ancient one, the arms are slower than they are now but the core has the same length arrow so there's in this thing it's implying that between early galaxies and present galaxies there's a speed up in the arm rotation the arms uh, don't look like they've changed shape very much but they've gotten well, they've spread out it's the same image obviously so it's yeah. just um they're just adding data on it and using it as okay. an example of display Going back to the other chart where Chuck pointed out the early and late um, type of thing, that's backwards from how I learned it in the 60s because the uh, idea that was displayed there was that the, the spiral galaxies came first and then they gradually collapsed into a elliptical galaxy, which is now called the early type. So um, galaxy life cycle is a little bit mysterious at least to me mm. but i'll look into that some more and see what we can find yeah this is in the same wikipedia article as I think uh, stuff I got. the only really thing we seem to think is is for sure is that the the ellipticals are older and result from multiple mergers and therefore they're more uh, haphazard in their rotation Sounds good. Did I miss the part about the uh, amount of these individual categories? Most galaxies, I would imagine, are spirals, right? And you're spirals uh, about twenty-five percent. What? I, most of the galaxies that are photographed are spirals because they look good. But when I look up galaxies to focus on and look, I I think a lot of them, if not most of them, are spirals. I mean. Uh, um, Ellipticals. Ellipticals. Really? They're, they're boring. So Jerry, they're what does the word lenticular mean? What is that? That's what I was defining in here. It means lens shaped. Yeah. Lens shaped, yeah. So it's got a it's got a um, love handles around the middle, and otherwise it looks like a um, elliptical galaxy. But no. so Tim has a Tim has a question about uh, does the rotation speed have to do a lot with the central black holes? No. Um, the, the the speed, of course, is the big missing matter thing, the the arm speed, and that's where the hypothesis for these different theories, dark matter and modified Newtonian dynamics, are attempting to answer. Um, dark matter seems to be the favored approach nowadays hmm. how about the bars in the middle those are spirals that's i, under, I understand that but is that part of the uh the growth of the, do the regular non-bar become bars or does it go the other yeah. way around 
We now that know. would be a lenticular. Yeah, that is a lenticular, and so would that. Okay. Look at that. What is that? Does that got a name? That's a real galaxy we're looking at. Right? Is that the black it's eye, though? It looks like the black eye, but it's not. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Wow. Lenticular galaxies, lens shaped. There's the cartwheel. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very interesting shape. That's a galaxy, not an exploding star? No. It's a galaxy. That's a galaxy. It's curious that the uh, outer ring is not concentric with the middle. Well, from our point of view, yeah, it might be foreshortened for us. Yeah, they think these form when you oh, get yeah, a direct. Yeah, okay. They think these form when you get like a direct head-on collision between two galaxies. And are those two on the left in the distance, or are they coming in little small ones next to it? You suppose. You know, in a few billion years, Andromeda and the Milky Way are going to have a collision. Yes. And that's been modeled as much as you can with supercomputers showing where the, the not where the individual stars are, but how stars at different distances from the core of the Milky Way are most likely to be affected. And what I saw for our solar system is very much like this, that the, the region of our galaxy that we're in is likely to be thrown off into space. So the speculation was made that um, our solar system, if it's still a solar system, uh, may just get flown free of our galaxy, not be in any galaxy after that. Oh, hell. Well, I better sell my house. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. Amazing. Or what's left of it. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, no planets are going to hit other planets when that happens. Fascinating stuff. It's covered several weeks, these lenticulars. Where do you get this stuff? Telescope magazine, astronomy magazine? Oh, Sky I read all sorts of stuff. Books, magazines, uh, news articles. The BBC and the New York Times and uh, one other one, uh, Atlantic, I think, does uh, has really good science columns. And a lot of it is, shows up on there. Um, the Onion, I don't read for astronomy. And the, what's that one? The Boardwin Report. I forget the name of it. Uh, my wife reads it to me all the time. It's a satire news release site that's just creative as hell. Yeah. I often wonder why modern day preachers don't go out on a limb and in the middle of services say, Guess what? They just discovered in God's universe. There's a new nebula. Uh, a killer <laughs> Over 6,000 years ago. Did, yeah. you, uh, did you guys see the new movie or Netflix thing called Don't Look Up? Oh, yeah. That's, that's supposed pretty... to be a, that's a takeoff on reaction, some of the reaction country to the vaccinations. Yes, it's a, it's a political satire. Exactly. Yeah. I didn't see it, but I know all about it. It's coming, but nobody cares or... No, the, the government's official stance is don't look up <laughs> when this, you know, end of life on Earth comet is heading directly for Earth. Just they don't, don't want to accept up. it. They don't don't like accept global, it. global warming, that doesn't happen. What the hell? Yeah. I think Meryl Streep plays the president in that, I think. Oh, everybody's in it. It's a, great, <laughs> it's a good movie. Leo DiCaprio. Would you like to talk um, constellations or uh, open star clusters? We get a lot of the beehive, of course, uh, open cluster in uh, Cancer, M44, gentlemen. It's uh, more than 35 degrees high. Uh, might emerge from the background as a magnitude four fuzz. Magnitude four, four you can see with a naked eye, can't well, you? But, it, but this, is, this is integrated magnitude, Ron, so it's spread out. Oh. But yeah, you can see it naked eye as a little fuzz patch. The ancient Greeks used it to predict the weather. If you could see it, it probably wasn't going to rain the next day. Oh, okay. It's like the old red sky in the morning, sailor's warning, yep. red sky at night. Yep. Easy to see with the naked eye. Here it is. I answered my own question. It's Spain. easy to see right at the center of the constellation of Cancer, which in my view is a very hard constellation to spot. Uh -huh. It's the it's empty right space between yeah. Gemini and Leo. Who do you suppose named it the beehive? Or Presieri the manger? 
Pre mm -hmm. Precipe, the manger, is, mm -hmm. was the original name, and Acellus borealis and Acellus australis that you see there were two donkeys that were eating out of the manger. Right. Okay. Um, but but I think it's after they got photography that people called it the beehive because there's a structure in it that looks like an old style conical beehive. Well, they were looking at the sucker 260 BC. It's 580 light years away, 35, no, 350 or so stars. It's according to your notes, 730 million years old. Scientists think it was associated with the Hyades over in Taurus. Why would they think that? I wonder. We're looking right at it. This is it. Yeah, so we're on the time. One of the times that we're up at the uh, gun club, <clears throat> I could see the uh, the the, the uh, beehive cluster naked eye. It's big. It was down, it was over in the uh, what direction would that be? The west. I guess it was getting ready to set. But, uh, uh -huh. It was. I had never seen that before. It's actually kind of. I have to put a focal reducer on my scope to see the whole thing. Yeah, it's so quite large. This picture makes it look small. This is kind of the emphasizing the central region that has that sort of conical beehive in it. Right. And what are these things out here? They're part of it. So these. Well, I thought the little is... triplets of stars were the, some of the bees flying around. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing's official. Yeah. Oh, that's. Talking nice about this. Fuzzed. The diagram we almost saw for a second there. Uh, the triplets old... don't show up as well in here as they do naked eye. They're very visible in the naked eye. Or I'm in telescope, not yeah. not as a photograph. Well, I think this guy was trying to measure uh, what, uh, how close the star was versus how far away and relate them all together. Looks like he's trying to develop structure. 1875. <clears throat> Recipe, the man the manger, which is an eating place for animals, I guess. 260 BC. Fascinating. What's oh, is that our comet? No, this oh. is just a comet passing by the beehive cluster. Yeah. Oh. Comet. Neat. If there's not very little more to say about uh, the beehive, you want to go to comet 19P, Borelli? It's going away, apparently. Yeah, it's a mm -hmm. For yeah. our, in terms of our talking about it, this is the swan song. This Where is, is what? And it has one of Chuck's favorite finder charts in it. Yeah. <laughs> so, but uh, Comet Borelli has now faded to around magnitude 9.5. Uh, it's passing Uranus in the night sky. So it's a nice, really when you get two, two different objects together, uh, you can make nice photos of it. If they get close enough. Going back out into the Oort cloud or the Kuiper belt? Well, you pick. It's, head, it's heading that way. Heading that way. <laughs> it's done its damage. Wow. Okay, is that it for Comet at 19P Borelli? Here, here, here's, a, here's a shot of the orbit of, uh, of the uh, Borelli here. It looks like it's pretty wide orbit there. Oh my God, that, that almost straight line? Yeah. It's amazing. That's going way out into the Oort cloud. Yeah, yep. it's going a lot. Got a long way to go. We'll never see it in our lifetime again. The odds of two big comets colliding way out there are about the same as any two stars. It just doesn't happen. So Bruce reminded me of a cartoon I saw many moons ago from BC, where it showed the anteater hiding behind a tree, and he's looking at two ants that are talking. And they're looking up at the tree and the leaves. And one ant says, do you think ant will ever make it to the leaves? And uh, the other ant says, not in our lifetime. And the ant either says, you can say that again. <laughs> OK, this, uh, you can see where Tom has scaled the orbit. And this is a periodic comet that's actually within the orbit of Jupiter and Saturn here. So it's not going to yeah. be that long term. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. It just looked that way when we were really zoomed in. So it's a, it's for all intents and purposes it's a it's an asteroid, isn't it? Except it's active, yeah. It's an asteroid with volatiles on board. Yeah. Like a like a centaur. A centaur, if it burned out and weren't active, you know, if it used up its volatiles, most of them, then they'd call it a centaur from this kind of orbit. 
Really? Well, what is the orbit, orbital period, do we know? I'm sure it's a quick lookup. Uh, right, you know, similar between Jupiter and Saturn kind of period, probably like Jupiter because it comes in so close. Yeah, that's going to put it in you know, 80 years or yeah. less. I bet it's like 12 years. Well, 12 would put it in synchrony with Jupiter. That might be dangerous. Yeah. I suppose it came from the Trojans? No. Not one of those, huh? Actually. For the benefit of the folks that don't know what Trojans are, look it up. We talked about it weeks ago. We're headed there, though, aren't we? One of our probes. Lucy. Lucy's heading to Trojan land. And um, actually there's an occultation campaign for Eurybates, which is one of the uh, Trojan asteroids that's gonna visit that's coming up. Huh. Do asteroids ever make a tail like a comet? Occasionally, yes. Okay, it looks like it's got a seven year period. That's quick. So we could see it again soon. Yeah, a little over seven years, 2,484 days. Be hopeful, Bruce. So everything we said about Piper Belt and, and Oak Cloud disregard, it's coming yep. back eventually. Reset. Unlike the Haley's, which goes way out there and takes 76 wow. years. Well, there's Leo the lion cat we could go to, or the- Yeah, let's look at Leo, because that's my favorite uh, part of the sky because of all the galaxies we get out there. Okay, it's got its brightest star magnitude 1.4 Regulus, 79. And those, that, those that saw the total eclipse in Oregon in 2017 will remember Regulus as the star you could see during the eclipse right next to the sun. So if you look down below the tail, below the nebula, Bruce, I mean, uh, Tom, kind of slide the whole thing up so we can see what's in Coma Bernices. You can see all these Messier objects down there. Those are all galaxies. What? Really galaxies? And a lot of those are elliptical galaxies. Boring. <laughs> Except when you can get a whole bunch in the same field. Yeah. Or if you have a scope big enough to resolve them into stars. Yeah. Well, and M87's in there in Virgo. That's the one where we got the black hole view. Yeah. That's right. First picture of a black hole. What's coma mean again? Hair. Hair. Coma is hair in space? Bernice's hair. Yeah, Berenice was supposedly a queen of Egypt that uh, her husband, the pharaoh, was out on a military campaign. And she wanted him to come back safe. So she cut off her hair. She was known for her beautiful hair. She cut off her hair. She put it on the altar in whatever, you know, facility they had for that. And uh, it disappeared. And um, the story was it went up into the sky. It became these stars. Hmm. But as far as the word meaning unconscious, it's short for comatose. That's a totally different word. <laughs> Got it. Fascinating stuff. So we're up there in Leo the Lion Cat. Yes, and you see M65 and M66. That's two thirds of the Leo triplet. Um, and the third one in NGC, um, also referred to as the Hamburg. They make a nice little triplet because they're all put together and you can get them in the same field of view with a small scope. Okay, there's an asterism out there called sickle of Leo. It's like a big backwards question mark. Oh, yeah, that's, that's yeah. Move Regulus so is the base the of the top. question mark. Where is it? It's not prominent in this particular uh, row, um, drawing, but uh, Tom just from Algeba, Adhafra, Rasselas, and that other star to the right of it there. That's the sickle. And it outlines Leo's lion head. Yeah. Facing west as the lion sits in a uh, front on a profile. I'm yeah, the, the way I'm used to it, the way my eye connects it, it goes from regular, regular to Triton to Denebola in a straight line, essentially, or close to a straight line. And then um, from De Denebola to Zosma and back down to Triton, there's a little triangle on the butt end. And then it goes just like 
Tom did for the sickle of love, and that's pretty much the whole uh, constellation. All these extra lines that are thrown in kind of make it hard. It's not the way I think of it. Those stars are too faint. I think this is an H.A. Ray version of the constellation. Okay. Hmm. Look at the lion. It's on the uh, zodiac, and therefore we can see it any night of the year, or does it go below the horizon? Oh, half of the year. Half of the year we see it. Well, yeah. depending on how late you stay up. That's right. That's right. <laughs> There's about a third of the year you don't see it, or a quarter of the year, or something like and, that. So. And Regulus is almost right on the ecliptic, and so often it'll be um, occulted by the moon. Huh. Where, how yeah, what the Tom has got here on, on it's annoying software is uh, closer to the way I think of it. And I've seen it before. For the sickle, yeah. Yeah, for the sickle and then for the table, uh, for the tail. That's the pattern that pops out to my eye in the sky. <laughs> yeah, this is the more traditional rendering of the lines. Yeah. You suppose most of these figurines, these 88 constellations, were in effect when old man Messier began naming his objects? Oh, sure. He, he, so he didn't have to, he wasn't part of this. No. A lot of this goes back to Mesopotamia. Yeah. Well, Rome did have its bears and lions inside the Colosseum, didn't it? Versus Christians and the... Mm. Every, these dry charts vary with culture and they vary with time. The only thing official about constellations nowadays is the borders between them. Other than that, the shape is up at for what's popular or what you're used to or what you like. Well, how far away from this would be Scorpius? Is that in a different direction? Yep, pretty much. That's way over here. See, Tom's going to it, just rising barely in the morning. Yeah. What your note said, early views of the summer constellation Scorpius, the dreaded phobia of people with arachnophobia, arachnophobia, <laughs> even though the scorpion is not a spider. Huh. It's a creepy crawly, but what the hell? I forgot to put in the finder chart for scorpion, Scorpius. That's all right. We can save this for next week. If yeah, you want. this is fine. The thing is, it's, it, it's high in the sky in July and June. And in the uh, tail region, it, it does it does remind you of a scorpion or me anyway. I'm just used to it. But down in the region where Tom has got the cursor down there, the tail of scorpion, um, you if you get a clear view of it on a dark night, you can see a uh, asterism that's called the false comet. False right comet. Yeah. That would be in false some, comet in, nebula. Yeah. Well, it's 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 faint things coupled with stars that um, it looks just like to the naked eye only. It just looks like a comet, but if you look at it in your scope, it breaks up into stars and a open star cluster and nebula. Yeah, if you zoom back out, Tom, it you can see the sort of comet effect um, right about there. It's kind of like the head of the comet has the brackets around it, and the tail goes up and to the left. Yeah. In Polynesia, uh, in, in uh, the seafaring cultures down there, they didn't have scorpions apparently, so they called it the fish hook of Maui. Oh yeah. <clears throat> huh. There's a couple oh, of. There goes a satellite. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, here's another one. No, they must not have all everybody. the musk satellites in there, otherwise this would be really busy. <laughs> a really bright one. Really Maybe big. that's an asteroid. NORAD 37781. So that's an asteroid. No, it's a it's a it's a, a satellite. Hayanga 2A? Yeah. So Hayanga. Chinese. Hmm. Oh yeah, artificial satellite. Okay. Is cool. a satellite in our picture? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it that's was. It just went through his software. This is moving? This is Yeah. No, no, it, it moved. It's gone. You can see the clock ticking down below. He's running in real time here. Yeah. Damn, son of a gun. I missed it. It's like our star party. Incidentally, are we having the star party? So far, so good. 
So far, yeah. The, the Omicron spike is coming down very steeply and very nicely. Well, you might want to give the date on that, gentlemen, if you know it. March 12th. Second, second Saturday. Second Saturday of the month, March 12th, starting at 7 o'clock. Everybody must be masked. Participants, visitors, everybody. How do we know if our visitors have been vaccinated? We don't, but everybody has to be masked. Well, are we going to have an online board meeting and then everybody jump in their cars? And drive no, there? we're going to have an in-person board meeting. Right, oh. Ron. I, I told you earlier, we're going to have the meeting in the observatory circle. At, at 4.30, I'm assuming, because that's the time we've been having them. Right. Okay. I don't, don't recall you telling me that. I'm sorry, I missed that. I'll be there this time. I don't need any bloody invitation from Tom Totten. I'll get one <laughs> on Monday mornings. <laughs> well, we got about uh, five minutes, gentlemen. You want to uh, visit um, the open star cluster inside Perseus, the hero, or there's one other, uh, Owl Neb Nebula, the Owl. That was short. That's up in Ursa Major, where they're focusing the web. It's after sunset. Since the moon's shrinking down, I assume Owl is a is M ninety seven. Yep. Yeah. The planetary nebula created as an aging star puff, puffs away its outer atmosphere, and it's twenty six hundred light years away. That sucker's out there. There it is. That's supposed to look like an owl. See the two dark eyes. Yeah, it does to me. Oh, okay. It's an owl. Tilt your head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, my experience with astronomical owls is terrifying. When I'm out in my backyard in the middle of the night, 1 or 2 a.m., and um, I, I don't hear a thing, but all of a sudden, this great big white thing, like a sheet, just comes gliding right it, very low over me. And at first, it, 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 it starts, I get real startled, um, but it's, it's a, just a white, some type of owl. Probably a barn owl. They're very white they, underneath. They are absolutely quiet. Not a sound. If I was a frog, I'd feel threatened. <laughs> but this M97 we're looking at was one star at one time. Yes. And yes. Now, now it's a white dwarf surrounded by what we're looking at? Yep. yep. And it was a sun-like star in terms of its size and mass. And it's in the north, Ursa Major. Yes, it's up near uh, Big Dipper. Um, yeah, the Big Dipper. Like the bottom of the bowl of the Big Dipper. Yeah. Oh, okay. We're going to get a map of that here. And it's, uh, there, yeah, there okay. we go. Yep. See M97 right next to M108. Oh, I see. Does anybody know which star in that mass we're looking at is being looked at by Webb? Something oh, like it's it's uh, it's not going to be one of the labeled ones. It's it's HD18018, yeah. something like that. And they picked yeah, it because it's Trek almost from... alone. In the field of view. Yeah. Jerry, what'd you say? Do you... Oh, okay. I was just saying we had a star, a finder chart for that star about two weeks ago or one week ago or something. Two weeks ago, I guess. I thought it was up above Dubé. Yeah, up, up in the kind of the neck or the head of the, of yeah. the bear somewhere. Okay. So it's a bright star they picked, but not that bright. It's uh, the telescope hasn't cooled down enough for the really dim stuff, right? No, it hasn't. No, not for the DMIR stuff. So Jerry, it's, it's, fu it's funny in this chart, this is Wikipedia, that they didn't show, since they call it Ursa Major, they're just showing the Big Dipper. That they're not showing the head and the, and the legs coming down. I, I think that's because most people recognize the Big Dipper, but not the bear so much. Where did the Big Dipper come from? Who named it that? Who was the first to have ladles to get water? <laughs> 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 It's it's actually not the Big Dipper, Ron. Ron, it's it's called the plow. Yeah. Oh. Or the wagon. Charles's wagon. So John John Deere named it the plow. It looks like more of a shopping cart to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's uh, that's Corvus the crow because it's got a wobbly wheel on it. Oh. <laughs> I'll be dang it. So M eighty one, M eighty two up there at the top. Those are nice galaxies to get in the same field of view. Bode's galaxy and um, the sidecar. Yeah. Look at all those M's. Good old Messier named him just uh, went around. He was Northern European. <laughs> was he? That's where he observed from. So there's no M's in the Southern Hemisphere? 
I don't know. I don't well, think so. There um, are M's it, technically in the Southern Hemisphere because they're below the projection of the equator in the sky. But once you go beyond what he could see from Paris, you don't get any M's. Yeah. And he did how many? 100, <laughs> no, 110. 110. 110. Now that looks like an owl. There you go. All we need is that a looks like a cartoon character. Yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I'm very surprised. This is before cameras. Yeah. yeah. Well, gentlemen, I think we just about run out of time and it's been fascinating and I learned a lot. I just wish I could keep it up there in my aging brain, but happy one year, 52nd, yeah. 50 52nd, but we're going to have a 53rd before we say goodbye to this year. And that'll be in uh, the 28th, a week from today. This is President's Day, the version uh, number 52. And gentlemen, we'll meet again together and hold hands after revving up our tuplas on the streets. Both Tom, well, we lost one Tom. Tom uh, Totten, we'll Come see on. you next week. BKM has left. Bruce and Jerry and and Mr. Catman, <laughs> outreach coordinator. <laughs> Chuck, we'll talk to you all next week. Thank you very much.